Hey, I'm Chris Ralph, the professional prospector, and today we're going to be talking about how to make copper from scratch, part two. Yep. Now, one of the things we talked about last time was how mankind had found these beautiful blue and green rocks, and he found out they made great jewelry and other things, decorative stuff, and, uh, he found out that he could turn this blue and green rock into a very useful red metal, copper. And the thing is, and I talked about this in the last video, was that um, that blue and green, those are called oxidized copper minerals, and they form through the reaction of oxygen in the air and water from rain or whatever in the ground, and they work on these minerals and that's how you get the pretty blue and green rocks. But because those are products of air and water, once you get far enough down into the ground, eventually you get out of the zone where there's air near the surface. There's not air and oxygen in the center of the earth. So you get down anywhere from 50 to 100 to a couple hundred feet, depending on where you are, and you get out of that zone of oxide rocks and you get into a zone of black and metallic yellow colored rocks that are heavy, but they're different from those blue ones. And it's not as easy to turn this rock into copper metal as it is with the other oxidized rock. So today we're gonna to talk about how mankind figured that out and who was it that figured out? Who was it that first did converting these black sulfur, sulfide minerals? Uh, because it is a copper mineral and it does have copper in it, but it's copper and sulfur instead of copper and oxygen. Who was it that first figured that out? It was the Romans. The Romans figured out how to take these sulfide ores and turn them into copper metal, just like they were able to turn the oxidized copper ore that we looked at in part one. So today we're gonna to take a further look at sulfide minerals of copper and how they work and how you can get them into copper metal. Because the truth is, in today's world, most of the ores we mine are this sulfide type ore, the chief mineral of which is chalcopyrite. Now, we do mine some uh, of the oxidized ores, and I told you a little bit how we process that in the modern way in the last video, but these sulfide ores require special treatment, and we're gonna talk about how that's done today, and we're also going to go outside again and do our own manufacturing copper from these sulfide minerals. Now in the old days, centuries, even more than a thousand years ago, when they mined copper ores in the ground, whether it was sulfide or oxides, they took only the highest grade stuff. And even when the Romans were mining sulfide ores, they only took the highest grade stuff. But today, we just can't afford to do that. There's not so much high, high grade stuff. We have to be able to take the low grade ores, the, the ores that only have a small percentage of copper in them, and turn them into copper metal. Well, let's show you some of those minerals. I'm going to show you some pictures right now of the various copper minerals, the sulfide minerals that are out there. This brassy yellow colored mineral here is chalcopyrite, and it's actually the most productive or most common copper bearing mineral that's turned into the metal copper. It's a combination of iron, copper, and sulfur. And it occurs in many places. It's uh, an important copper ore. This is bornite, another copper sulfide mineral made of copper, iron, and sulfur, but just in a little bit different ratios than the chalcopyrite we just looked at. It's sometimes called peacock copper ore because of its beautiful iridescent sheen. It's also an important ore of copper. This is chalcosite, another copper sulfide mineral, only this one doesn't have any iron in it. It 
actually contains a lot more copper because of the lack of iron and so it's almost 80 percent copper by weight it's an important mineral that forms by the reconcentration naturally of uh, copper sulfide minerals now once they've processed once they mine these rocks and they may have one or two percent sometimes even less than one percent copper in them they have to concentrate it because when you have 99% rock and 1% copper, that's just not a good enough grade to be able to do much with. And in order to do the smelting process, they have to first concentrate those that 1% of copper into a concentrate that's maybe 60 or 80% copper. And so what they do is a process called flotation. And it sounds kind of crazy because I'll tell you, these sulfide minerals, they're heavy. They, they're dense, they don't uh, float easily, but they have a characteristic that they repel water. They don't like to get wet. It's hard to wet them. And so what they do is they put them in a special bath and they make a big froth in that bath and the little tiny particles of the sulfides would rather stick to the air in the, the bubbles than to be wet and sink to the bottom of the bath. So they use this flotation process and they're able to concentrate and produce uh, material that has a lot of copper in it, even though they're starting with ores that are very low grade. So the next thing after they've taken that concentrate is they will go ahead and, um, and, and dry it out, get any moisture that's left. Of course, they separate it out from the bubbles and dry it out. And then they put it in a smelter. And the smelting process for this normally consists of basically uh, heating it up real hot. And because of the sulfur, the sulfur actually burns the, in the sulfide minerals. Sulfur is flammable. And they burn the sulfur and actually capture the sulfur and turn it into sulfuric acid. So this process not only produces copper metal, but it produces a byproduct of uh, sulfur gas that they turn into sulfuric acid, which is a very important industrial commodity, uh, battery acid and all kinds of things. You know, your car battery has sulfuric acid in it. And so uh, they, they, they produce this byproduct sulfuric acid from the sulfur. And then they take the, the mat, which is mat is the sulfide when it's been melted. They take the sulfide ores, concentrate the sulfide minerals, and then literally heat them up to the point where they melt. And then they blow air through it. They blow oxygen through it. And the oxygen coming in through the pipes and blowing through the molten, and this stuff is bright red hot. It's, it's not cool to melt. It's easy, it's, it takes a lot of heat to melt that stuff. And it's bright red hot and they blow air through it and literally the air will uh, strip the sulfur, the remaining sulfur off the copper. Literally, the, the sulfur would rather be with the oxygen from the air than with the copper and it ends up becoming copper metal and the sulfur oxide that's used for making sulfuric acid. And so when, when that happens, uh, the copper in there is converted from a sulfide to copper metal. And then they're able to, it's because it's so bright hot that it's a liquid metal, they're able to draw that off and, and make what they call blister copper. Let me show you an example of blister copper. You can see that it has a blistery kind of surface to it. Um, it's because there's actually gases in the material that are coming out as the copper is cooling from a, a liquid to a solid. And that's how you get these blisters because there's literally gases coming out of the, the copper. So then they take this copper and of course this isn't pure enough to treat. I'll tell you a little bit uh, how they treat that blister copper and make it pure enough to be used for manufacturing processes. But first we're going to go outside and take a look and um, go ahead and I, I'm going to take some of my sulfide samples like this and I'm going to crush it down and we're going to convert it into copper metal just the way the Romans did. Only, well, sort of like the Romans did because the Romans did use air like the modern process. Me, because I can't really blow air through uh, molten red hot uh, copper ore. 
that's been melted down, yeah, that's not really a thing. So I'm gonna use a slightly different process that, that is to use iron, steel, uh, basically metallic steel, as a, a, a transfer agent. What will happen is the steel will want to combine with the sulfur more than it combines with the sulfur combines with the copper. And so just like the oxygen does in the modern process where the sulfur wants to be with the oxygen more than it wants to be with the copper, the sulfur will want to be with the iron more than it wants to be with the copper. And so the iron will displace the copper and will end up with some of the iron melting and going into the liquid and some of, and then copper metal coming out. And so I'll heat it up, we'll convert using iron and just and it's just going to use scrap iron some bolts and and some other junk that i have we'll just use that to displace the copper that's in the sulfide ore so it's kind of similar to what the romans are doing it's just i'm using scrap iron instead of air to uh to create the copper metal out of the sulfides and then we'll pour it off and again i'll have a, a chunk of uh, copper that i've made from scratch so here's a look at the chunks of copper sulfide minerals that I'm going to use to make copper ore out of. Now, this stuff, you might look at it and say, oh, well, I see the blues of oxidized copper on the surface. And yeah, it's just a surface coating. In a second, I'm going to show you what this ore looks like when it's all crushed up, and you'll see that there just isn't that light blue coloration to it. In the inside of these rocks, it's dark black colored and other combinations there's a little bit of uh, colors of uh, gold uh, sprinkled through there but it's it's a mixture of different sulfide minerals honestly the the most of the sulfur uh, minerals by weight are pyrite but there's a significant amount of copper in there I expect this stuff is uh, somewhere on the order of maybe 12% uh, copper by weight so here are the sulfide minerals you can see then yeah, while there's a little bit of sprinkling of oxidized the blues and greens through there, it really is a gray, uh, metallic kind of looking. If uh, if you see it in person, it does have a little bit of a metallic sheen that shows that this is by far and away mostly sulfide minerals. And this is what we're going to use in our smelting home smelting exercise to produce copper. So I'm going to take this material and I will mix it with some borax and some sodium carbonate. Uh, these are standard fluxes and I'll use that for better melting and uh, better liquefaction of the, the whole mix. So I've got that crucible here, the sulfide mixture with uh, steel at the bottom and lots of uh, flux in there. I even put some glass, broken glass on top. So I've got that mixture here. It's all ready to go. I'm gonna put it in the crucible. We're gonna light it off and let the iron do its job of displacing the copper in the sulfides and therefore giving us a, a nice result with some good copper metal, just like we got on the other video, only this time with sulfides. Here's just a close-up view of the crucible looking down. You can see the glass that I put uh, on the top there. I was hoping that the glass would form a slag and just kind of seal the sulfides in and minimize any smoke that came out. Okay, we've been heating for an hour and we're ready to pour. Here we go.
Okay, well, we've got it poured. We've got it poured and it's got to cool off for a while, but give me some time. I'll let it cool off for half an hour and then we'll come back and I will turn it over and we'll see what we got in the way of copper. Okay, well, I'm ready to turn it over and see what we get. It's cooled enough now, so. And again, it doesn't really want to come out. So let me see what I can do. Okay, I've loosened it up. Let's see. Doesn't look like we have any real obvious metal. Let's see if there's some on the inside of the slag. Well, I don't know what to say. I've gone through the all the slag material and there was not a button of copper. Um, there's a whole lot of matte material here, the, uh, the molten sulfides that melted. We got them melted, but the iron just didn't react. Uh, now, I've done this kind of test and, and kind of experiment with lead minerals before, and because copper is less active than lead, I figured that it would reduce fine out of uh, the sulfide with the steel, but apparently it did not. And so I was not successful in obtaining any copper this way. It just shows why it's so difficult. It was so much easier to get the copper out of the oxidized minerals than it was out of the sulfides. And so it was a, a big development when the Romans and other uh, metallurgists of a couple thousand years ago were able to take sulfur bearing uh, or sulfide copper minerals and turn them into copper metal. I can't blow air through it, so this is going to have to be the best that I can do. So that was a total bust. I mean, literally, when I broke open the, the pour, you could see that the sulfides had completely melted, and the uh, bits of iron were in among the sulfides, but there was no copper. And like I say, I was really confused by that, because I've done very similar things before with lead ores and gotten nice lead out of it. So we're going to have to go back to the drawing board, literally, and we're going to try something different to pick out the, uh, the copper in the sulfide ores. And we're going to try what historians call an intermediate step between processing the oxidized copper ores and the sulfide copper ores called co-smelting. And what that is basically is mixing the copper oxides, which have oxygen with the copper, and the copper, copper sulfides, which have sulfur with the copper, and getting them to interact directly instead of the normal sulfide smelting method, which is to blow air through the, the molten sulfide mat. Um, what happens here is in the, the regular smelting, the oxygen from the air being blown through the mat, the oxygen grabs onto the sulfur and they take off together as a gas, leaving copper metal behind. Well, in this process, the, the oxidized copper has oxygen attached to it and the copper sulfides have sulfur attached to them. And so the oxygen that's in with the copper oxide minerals and the sulfur in with the copper sulfide minerals combine and do basically the same thing as when they're blowing the air through the molten sulfides. The oxygen combines with the sulfur and off it goes, leaving copper metal behind. So that's what we're going to try and do this time. It's take two to see if we can make this work. And it should. I mean, it's something that was done by the ancients. It's not something I'm inventing or making up. We're hoping to show you guys and, and demonstrate that the technology of the ancients still works today. Now I'm going to do this in a two-step process. Basically, I'm going to just combine the oxide minerals and the sulfide minerals. I'm going to take the, the poured mat that I got and re-crush it back up 
uh, because it's now in big chunks, I'll crush it back up to fine material. And I've got uh, another bag that I took out of some ore that I have uh, that's uh, copper oxide, oxidized copper mineral. It's mostly uh, chrysocolla and malachite, some azurite, uh, but it's oxidized copper minerals. And we will put those in there and see if we can't get it to work. Like I say, in a two-step process, first getting the uh, two, the oxidized minerals and the sulfide minerals to react. And then as I did with the uh, oxidized minerals to begin with, I'll do a second step where I add a flux, crush it all back up and add a flux, and then uh, melt it and pour hopefully a, a real nice uh, copper button or bar. So that's the plan. And let's go see how it works. So I've crushed up the sulfides again and I've crushed up that oxidized the copper ore that I had said that I picked out. And on the previous segment, I said that I was gonna do this in a two-step process. I was gonna melt uh, the, the sulfides with the oxide uh, material together and, and, and then do a separate step with the flux. And I decided to just combine it all into one. So the flux is in here, the oxidized copper is in here, and the sulfides all crushed up are in here as well. So I'm gonna get started on lighting the furnace and we'll give it a good time to run and then we'll pour it and see how it comes out. So let's get started. Check it in a while. Okay, we're up to temperature and it's time to make the pour. So let's turn the gas off and see what we got. Okay, so there is some copper in there. I can see it. So we did make some copper, that's good. How much we got at the bottom of the pour, I don't know. We'll have to find out when we turn it over. We will see that in just a bit. So by the time uh, it had cooled off enough that I could dump it out and, and check out what, what I got out of my melt yesterday, it was already really too dark to be filming. So today's the next day. Although there's a little tiny bit of copper in this, and I did get some copper out of it, for the most part, what I got was a big old wad of matte at the bottom. A lot of copper there, but just can't uh, seem to get it out. Now, I, you know, I think because I did get a little copper that I could probably fiddle with this and eventually make it work. But, you know, if, if I were an ancient metalsmith, then it would be worth my doing that because the copper would be a big prize. But I'm not an ancient metalsmith and I can buy whatever copper products I want at the hardware store. So it was a good experiment. It shows how hard it really was to make copper from sulfide minerals, that uh, it would take a lot of fiddling and testing and, you know, they eventually did find it. The Romans found that blowing air through the uh, mat would produce copper metal and I can't really do that. It's just not feasible and it's not worth the effort. So anyway, uh, 
Copper mat is important. Uh, it, it does produce copper metal and honestly most of the copper that's mined in the world today comes from sulfide ores. A small amount comes from the oxide ores. But anyway, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the next step, what happens in the production of copper from sulfide ores uh, between the actual processing of the mat and the delivery of the finished product to a manufacturer who then makes wire or pipe or whatever other copper product that it's needed for. So we're going to talk about what happens next after the smelting process is completed. You see the copper goes into, it's molten, it's poured into molds and they produce what they call blister copper. And here's a picture of some blister copper. You can see on the surface of it that there's these blisters and bumps. It, it literally comes from air and oxygen coming out of the molten copper as it finally cools and solidifies. It's bubbling up this dissolved air that's inside the molten copper. And that's why it's called blister copper because the air bubbles coming out make these blisters. Anyway, the the copper that is that way is not pure enough to use. It has other base metals. Uh, it also has small amounts of gold and silver and uh, even smaller amounts of platinum group metals. And so they need to purify that because copper for electric wire and even for pipes and other things has to be very pure so that they can, uh, you know, with the, the wire, if you have impurities in the copper, it won't uh, conduct very well. It'll make more heat instead of just conducting the electricity along. And with uh, pipes and stuff, they can't mold it or bend it or shape it into the pipes or whatever. And so it's important to have it purified. So what they do is a process called electrolytic purification of copper. And they take these big ingots of blister copper and they put them in a solution and it's got some copper in the solution and some uh, sulfuric acid and they literally put electricity at a relatively small voltage uh, from on the, the blister copper and the copper will travel off the blister copper ingot over to and then what they put in is a very pure uh, sheet of copper metal and the purified copper will migrate across the bath and redeposit onto that uh, sheet of very pure copper. And that way you purify what's here as it goes across. Now impurities that are in the blister copper ingot will drop off and settle as a sludge to the bottom of the container for the, the bath. And then they take that sludge and it's from that sludge then that they extract the gold, silver, precious metals and other base metals, including things like lead or zinc or stuff like that. So uh, uh, that's how they purify copper. It's a very important process. Um, it's not really super high tech, but it works really well and it produces the copper that's necessary in order to start the manufacturing process either for wire or pipe or a lot of other copper products. Now, most of my videos are about precious metals, but the next video we're gonna do is about prospecting for copper. We're gonna talk about copper deposits, various different copper minerals, both oxidized minerals that have the pretty blues and greens, or the sulfide minerals that have more of the metallic look to them. We're going to talk all about those and copper deposits and how to go out and find your own copper deposits. That's coming up in the next video. You'll see that in a week or so. Now, speaking of prospecting, and like I say, most of my videos are about prospecting for gold and sometimes for silver. I wrote a book about being a prospector. And the truth is, learning to be a skilled prospector, it's just like learning any kind of other trade. Whether you're learning to be an electrician or a plumber or, you know, a doctor or whatever, it's what you know that makes you uh, what into whatever it is. It's not 
um, you know, that the plumber owns some pipe wrenches, so therefore he's a plumber. No, it's what he knows about plumbing and how to fix problems or how to install new pipe and that kind of stuff. Same with the electrician. It's not his voltmeter that makes him into an electrician. Same with the doctor. It's not his stethoscope that turns him into a doctor. It's what he knows. And so whether we're talking about uh, uh, prospecting or whatever, it's what you know that makes you a skilled prospector. That's why I wrote this book um, it, because it has in it the knowledge you need to go out and find your own goal. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my book right now. So let me tell you a little bit more about my book. Um, it's called Bissful of Gold and I wrote it because I want you to be able to go out and find for yourself Bissful of Gold. And uh, you can see that it's a, an encyclopedia with all kinds of information, pictures, and that sort of thing. It's not in color, but uh, uh, color would have cost me a lot more to have printed, and so the book would have cost a lot more. It's for sale on Amazon, and you can pick it up. I'll put a link in the description below. I also serve as the editor for a, a prospecting magazine. It's ICMJ's Prospecting and Mining Journal. And honestly, you should check that out. We've got stories uh, and information, legal stuff, everything you know to increase your skills as a prospector. I write articles in this every month and a lot of other very experienced prospectors contribute to the magazine as well. So check the magazine out. Also, I have a website and the website is uh, at nevadaoutbackgems.com. I'll put a link for it in the description below. But there's gobs of information there that you will find useful in your prospecting efforts. Finally, I want to say that I really appreciate your comments and thoughts and even a positive criticism. Don't come on there and just toss out insults because I'll just delete your comments. But if you've got uh, helpful things to say and questions to ask, do write and, and put those in the comments because I answer my comments to people and uh, you'll hear from me in, in, you know, in, in responding to you. Uh, so if you've enjoyed this video and you like what you see and you're interested in uh, finding out more, well then sign up, subscribe and hit the, uh, the notification bell so they'll let you know when I post new videos and you know like it and share it if again you, you see stuff that you really are excited about and I'll be coming out with lots more new videos and so we'll see you again real soon.